Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the um, Transition Specialist Person-Centered Planning Introduction to Education and uh, Introduction to Person-Centered Planning and the Coaching that we're going to be doing through the MFP program, Open Doors program. I'm going to just j dive right in. Um, we're going to start with um, Tanya Richmond in North Carolina, and she's going to give you her title because she's got all sorts of fun titles and, and has a fantastic um, um, consulting business that uh, has put together this, this plan. Um, and then after Tanya is done, uh, I will jump in, explain more about the um, person-centered planning coaching uh, and roles and how this is all going to look, and then we'll answer questions. So without further ado, Tanya, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to see some of you again and, and happy to see some of you for the first time. Um, as Tammy said, I'm Tanya Richmond. I am with Support Development Associates, which is a small uh, consulting firm that works with person-centered practices um, internationally. And I'm also the chair of the learning community for person-centered practices. Um, and uh, we are also an international uh, community. And my whole career is really based around helping people uh, integrate person-centered practices in the work they're doing, learning about how to use this. And, and my passion is taking person-centered practices to scale. So I'm going to very quickly today go through with you just an overview of person-centered planning coaching um, that's going on related to the initiative in New York that you're all a part of. And um, I have some kind of high level stuff to share with you in terms of what this project is about. And then Tammy's gonna get into some further details with you as well. Um, I was hoping I could get some notes to come up for myself, but they won't do that. So I'm just gonna wing it. Uh, <laughs> I think I know this well enough to get through it. Um, but what we'll talk about this morning quickly is just um, a little bit of background, although this may be very familiar to you all. So I'm gonna hit it at a very high level. Um, around the home and community-based services um, rule and how it applies and intersects with uh, the coaching that we're talking about. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the model and what an outline of the six sessions is. Um, so for each of those, I have an outline for you. And um, then I'll talk very, very briefly about what person-centered thinking and planning is and show you the skills that people are working with. I understand you've been practicing and I thank you very much for doing that. Um, but I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. Remind you of our foundational concept, which is the balance between important two and important four. Um, we'll look at what we call a donut for coaches, which is about how we determine roles and responsibilities for people who are doing the coaching role. And, um, and then we're gonna talk very, very lightly about person-centered thinking and motivational interviewing and how they're used in conjunction with one another in this project in particular. Um, it is helpful, I think, often to just have a couple boundaries around our time together. So I call them meeting agreements. Um, and my big one is just be as present as you can. I know that everybody is being asked to multitask, demanded to multitask. Um, but I have to tell you, the, the older I get, the more um, I really understand that monotasking is basically what any of us can do at any time. So as much as you can, push your work to the side for just this little bit of time we have together. Um, and you know, ask questions if you have them. We'll have a time for that in the, in the end of the session. Um, if there's anything you need to be more comfortable um, in our time together, if you just want to put that in chat, I'll be happy to do my very best to honor that as well. Um, what we're going to talk about today and our learning objective is just the person-centered skills and concepts and this model that has been designed to coach people who use services and supports um, and really working through their own person-centered plan and using that plan to direct their services, to get their services in place, to fine tune things when they're uh, in place and maybe not working the way the person wants them. Um, and I would be curious about who you're all working with. So um, I know Tammy knows you all, I don't know you all, but if you could just drop for me in chat um, who you're working with, that would be really helpful for me. Um, I won't linger here, but I will take a peek there and just make sure that I'm including any references that might be helpful to you as we move through our time together today. So by way of reminder, um, the Home and Community-Based Services Final Rule, and this may be very familiar to you, so as I said, I'll hit this at a, at a super high level, 
um, is a federal regulation that was effective in March of 2014. And it's really about community integration and involve, involvement and independence. Um, if people are receiving services and supports through certain Medicaid funded um, streams of home and community based services. Um, so we call those HCBS services. Um, and so those federal standards put in place for us some person centered planning standards that are very robust and they are applicable to all of the, the services in New York, including uh, 1915 C waivers um, and NHTD. TBI, OPWDD, Community First Choice Options, 1115 um, waivers, and that includes managed care and managed long-term care and health homes, um, among other things. So basically, if anything's funded through that HCBS stream, this applies to it. Um, and the managed care final rule that was effective in 2016 is kind of a rolling part of that rule that put in place some person-centered planning standards that are similar to those of the HCBS rule. Um, you know, I think the important thing for us to remember, and I'm probably preaching to the choir, um, I think every time a new federal regulation comes through, my first response is not, oh, yippee, a new federal law to follow. Um, because I'm a social worker, I've been a social worker for over 30 some odd years now, and um, I have seen some stuff roll through our system that has not really been about quality, it's been about compliance. And I think it can be really tempting to push back on stuff like this when it's new to us. Um, but this is really the first time in my career where I felt like, mm, no, nope, this actually does align with what my values are as a social worker, because it focuses on intently what is important to a person in terms of them having balance in their life between um, what's important to them and what's important for them or how they see that in their own perspective. If I could ask all of you to check your mute buttons, I'm hearing a lot of feedback um, in, in my ear. So just check your uh, mute buttons if you can and, and click that if you happen to not be muted. Um, so I think it's really important for us to see this particular rule in that light because it's very helpful in terms of helping people have autonomy, uh, have a say in how their services and supports are designed and delivered, and to help us who are in helping roles understand from the person's perspective, what is the balance between important to and important for from that person's perspective, not from our own. Um, and this is really the first time ever in my career that I've seen legislation that lines up with what I'm in the world to do. I did not come to do compliance and paperwork. I came to help people. Um, and I think for those of us who do this work, it's, you know, we're not gonna get rich doing it and we certainly aren't gonna get famous doing it, um, but we certainly have a depth of job satisfaction because of the work we do, because we know that it makes a difference in the lives of people in the world. Um, and I think for all of us, that's a unified core um, value that we share. And this particular federal regu regulation or legislation lines up with that value. Um, and the other thing I will say about it is Medicare, Medicaid services speak the same language you do because they were trained by the Learning Community for Person Centered Practices. So I told you I'm the chair of that organization. And my company, Support Development Associates, actually trained CMS in person center practices. So we've trained trainers at CMS. They speak the same language, they use the same skills. So the nice thing about that is there's no like cross purposes about what it actually means to be person centered. Um, and you in New York have really been on a person centered journey for some time. Um, you all are doing some great stuff there and you may be further along in your practices than a lot of states are. But I think for all of us, there's always room to learn. Um, the home and community-based services final rule standards that apply to all settings, um, I think it's just really helpful for us to understand that this is about supporting access to the greater community and really doing that in the same way that people who do not use HCBS services and supports can access the community. Um, in addition to that, we want people to be able to seek competitive employment and work in settings that are integrated um, they can engage in the life of their community and really be able to control things like their personal resources in a way that really in the past we haven't paid a lot of attention to. Um, we want to make sure that the person is able to select the services and supports that they need to have that balance in their life 
from among all the settings options that exist, including those that are non-specific, non-disability specific settings. Um, of course, they optimize uh, individual initiative, autonomy, independence, and in helping the person make those choices for their life that represent the balance between important to and important for. And it helps the person um, have choice regarding the services and supports that they receive and who provides them. Um, I think in the past, historically, we've really thought about like, here's all the things that we provide and therefore your outcomes are this. This kind of flips everything on its head and says, what do you want life to look like? Here's what we can do to support you to have more of that in your own life. So I think about a good person-centered plan is kind of a, a picture, a complete picture of the person's life and balance from their perspective. And then I can take a look at the reality of how they're actually living. And there's always a gap between that. And that would be true for any of us on this training or anywhere in the world. There's a gap between perfect and what the reality is. And we might see our role if we are coaching that person to use skills as getting those two pictures to be somewhat closer together. They probably will never overlap but we can help the person have more of, of that balance from their perspective. Um, so the home and community-based um, final rule established a lot of new standards. Um, and one of those was that every person who has, um, who receives services through Medicaid funded HCBS um, has a person-centered service plan. And a significantly enhanced version of the person-centered plan, um, most of which uh, the conditions are required as of, of the rules March 2014 effective date, meaning it is here and we are doing it now. Um, and modification to the rules additional standards for provider-owned and controlled settings um, can be done on a case-by-case -case basis um, within person-centered plans. Um, which uh, we'll start to look at, or the, the HCBS will start to look at in 2023 in terms of compliance. What that means when you hear modification to the rules standards is a fancy and more nice way of saying restrictions. There are times um, in when we're supporting someone that they maybe present a risk that needs to be addressed through planning. Um, so that we're not only paying attention to what sits on the person's heart and is most important to them, but we also take into account that there's something um, related to their health and safety or being a valued member of community that we need to address in terms of risk. And so we can modify um, a plan to address the risk that we're seeing. So things, just an example of that might be people have a right to choose their own schedule when they're participating in activities or services and supports. However, if someone has a need to be assisted in developing their schedule because maybe they are isolated and they also have dementia and are not really thinking about how to engage with that program or other people, um, we might assist them to do that. So, and not just leave, oh, well, it's your choice to, to just set your own schedule really thinking through, does this best fit the person's need? Um, and the person center plan requirements are included in uh, 2402A of the Affordable Care Act. In addition to it, person center plans have to have the information needed to support the person so that they are, what I say, in the center of the planning process. So they're driving the planning process in all aspects possible. Um, that they include people, the planning process includes people that the person chooses to be a part of the planning process, um, not just people we choose, so not just professionals planning for the person, that people who know, who like and admire the person planning with the person, um, and that plans are happening in times and locations that are convenient to the person, and the person um, is really getting to think through the outcomes that they define for themselves in the most integrated community setting, not the, the organizational outcomes, not the agency's outcomes, but actual individual outcomes as defined by the person. So the easiest way to think about that is when the person says, this is what I see life as being, those outcomes should match that balance as the person describes it. We also want to make sure that um, the services are being delivered in a manner that reflects per a person's preferences and choices um, at the same time that we're doing what we have always done, which is ensuring that people are healthy and safe. Um, but it also takes into consideration the culture of the person served. 
um, and uses plain language that could be understood by the person and the people closest to them. If you will check your mute buttons, please. I'm still hearing a lot of feedback from someone. Um, just click on the little microphone and you'll see a red line come through it. And that means that you're muted. Um, Person-centered plans have to individual um, have to identify an individual's strengths and preferences, as well as their clinical and support needs and their desired outcomes. So in a nutshell and in very, very plain language, what the HCBS rule is um, expecting us to do is make sure that people are in the center of decisions about where they live, who they live with, what they do with their time and their resources, which services and supports they receive and who they provide, who they receive those services and supports from. So I wanna to talk to you about the role of the coaches, the person-centered planning coaches in this particular project. Um, and it's helpful just to start with, there's a difference between coaching someone and being an advocate. And I think many of us in helping professions are accustomed to being advocates. Um, so we advocate frequently on behalf of people that we work with, but coaches actually support and teach informally and they demonstrate through modeling. So the coaches in this project know how to use the skills. They've been practicing them with one another and they'll be practicing them, along, practicing them alongside the person who has transitioned so that that person knows how to then use those skills to do whatever it is they're, they're trying to do in their life. Advocates, on the other hand, speak in favor of someone they're advocating on behalf of. So often they are um, kind of the mouthpiece for someone, unless they're a self-advocate, then they would be the mouthpiece for themselves or for a group of people. But really it's a different stance altogether. So think of this as kind of coaching as a side-by-side -side stance that, um, that we might use as we're um, working with people. In this particular project, the person, the person-centered um, coaching sessions, person-centered planning coaching sessions, um, consist of six sessions, and they'll happen over two months. Um, there'll be um, a very, um, there'll be a formula for how each session works. So it starts with an opening question that is goal-oriented or summary-oriented. Um, or evaluation oriented. And the pur purpose for that is to kind of see how things are going and what still needs to be addressed. Um, there's going to be a works make sense analysis, which is a person-centered school, uh, school skill to establish focus um, each time the, the coach is with the person. And then the person and the coach will do a deep dive into a person-centered skill and in each session, um, and to explore you know, how they can get closer to that life and balance from the person's perspective. Um, all of the person-centered conversations that are happening in these coaching, coaching sessions use techniques from not only person-centered practices, but we combine some motivational interviewing techniques in this so that people can have a good understanding, coaches can have a good understanding of the imbalance between what's important to the person and what's important for them and an understanding of, of whether or not the person is maybe ready to change or what stage of change they're in, because that will make a big difference in how a coach would guide a person through a conversation. And then each session will end with a summary and a commitment to action. So in the first coaching session, there'll be an introduction to the coaching session and the model. So the person who has transitioned will get a, a big overview of what will happen in each of those sessions and why they're structured the way they are. Um, there will be a discussion about the home and community-based services rule, what it does, what it is, how it impacts them as a person, what the expectations are for their involvement, what it means for them, um, and what person-centered planning requirements are. And similarly, how does that impact their plan? Um, we give them some information about what person-centered thinking and planning actually is, because that is a word, person-centered is just out in the ether and people think they know what it is. The first time I was introduced to it, which has been around 18 or 19 years ago, I was like, this is no different than what I already do. I'm, I'm a clinical social worker. How dare anyone say I might not be person-centered? And what I learned over time and with practice is that there are so many things I could have been doing differently. I wish I could have kind of done the first half of my career over. And I don't think I was a bad social worker. I just think there are some things I would have approached much differently that would have honored better what was important to the person. And that's really the spirit that we take this with. It's really helping the person understand that they are 
um, really going to drive their own planning and make decisions for themselves that impact all the aspects of their life. And for some people, that's going to be new. For some people, that's going to be frightening. Um, and for some people, it's going to be something that they have to learn to do. So it's helpful to have someone side by side with them, helping them do that. Um, then they'll decide together, the coach and the person will decide what they're going to work on and what they'll learn. And then they'll do a closing and goal oriented questions for all the future of their work. In the second session, and you'll see a pattern here, always the first and last bullet look the same in every one of these. So I won't hit too hard on that, but there's an opening question that's goal oriented and it will review any information from session one related to that. Um, they'll talk about any changes or progress made since the last time they met together. They'll go over the concept, which is the foundational concept of, of person-centered practices, the balance between what's important to a person and what's important for them. They'll practice that together. And, and person-centered um, practices, people will often say important to, important for is a skill. It's not, it is a foundation. Uh, everything else in person-centered practice, we, practices we introduce you to is a skill. Important to and important for is the bedrock on which we build. And you can't do any of the skills until you first consider what is important to and what is important for the person. And the worst way to learn what's important to the person is to ask them. You really wanna have conversations that help you understand from the person's perspective. Because if I say, hey, Tammy, what's important to you? She's gonna tell me her top 10 and it's gonna be things like family, health, career, you know, on and on, community, uh, justice, you know, those kinds of things. It'll be the same 10 things I have, you know, pretty, pretty generically, we will have a top 10 list that resembles one another. If I have a conversation with Tammy and get to know her, I'm going to understand that to her family means this, and this is how they show up in her life, and this is how she shows up in their life, and that's going to be very different than how I think about family and their importance in my life. So what's important to you gets you nothing really of value. You have to have these good conversations using motivational interviewing and person-centered skills to get the good stuff. Um, and you're going to learn about that balance from the person's perspective. They'll update a one-page description or create one if the person doesn't have one. Most people may come out of, I'm, I shouldn't say that, my expectation would be that people might come out of the facility with a one-page description as part of the planning process. Um, in reality, probably a good portion of people come out of facilities without any of that in place. So they don't have a one-page description. And they may be creating one and building on that with the coach throughout the sessions. And then they'll close with a goal-oriented question and future work. Session three, they're gonna open again with that question, review any changes or progress made. They'll do a skill called the learning, um, uh, works make sense, doesn't work, doesn't make sense. And that's really to help get a current picture of what's working from the person's perspective and what's not. And that may be targeted to a specific issue or situation, or it may be general, just overall. Um, they'll do an analysis of the current situation, identify any other perspectives that might be helpful to include in that works make sense, doesn't work, doesn't make sense. Um, decide and agree on next steps based on the analysis and then um, close with that goal-oriented question. Um, session four, same opening, same review of changes, progress made. They'll learn to do a donut sort, which is about roles and responsibilities for people in their life. Um, they'll talk about who should provide that, that support, which might be an introduction or an opportunity to introduce the concept of how do you determine who should be providing those services and supports or what we would call matching. And um, then decide on next steps, do a closing question. They'll, session five, they'll do um, all the same steps in terms of the question and the re re review of progress. They're going to learn about the person-centered skills and what they're designed to do um, and identify any areas for uh, deeper learning. And again, closing is the same. Um, they will, in session six, open with a review of answers to goal-oriented questions from any of those future or, or earlier sessions. Um, they're going to look at four plus one questions and a learning log as everyday learning skills. Um, and then they'll give some individual feedback about the project and closing. So in using 
the person-centered skills, what the coach will be doing is focusing in on a number of targeted skills. Many of you have been practicing those. And as I said, thank you for doing that because it's going to make you much more confident when you have these um, conversations with people. And the ones we've picked out in particular for this, this um, series is listed here, but it doesn't mean you couldn't use any of the other person-centered skills as they were needed. Um, the 12 that we typically um, teach are, develop, are, are uh, broken up into three broad categories. So we look at discovery and listening skills, which is learning about the person. And primarily, coaches are going to focus there and on everyday learning skills, which include learning about that working, not working, four plus one, um, learning logs. The person will have a learning log. The coach will have a learning log. Um, but we do include some management skills, which are things like the donut about roles and responsibilities. Management skills are not skills for managing. They're about managing our roles and not for managers. They're about managing our roles in a person's life. I included for you all, and I'll show you um, where to get this online yourself, a link to the person-centered skill reflection chart. It's just a handy reminder about each skill and how it's used. Um, so I always say to, to coaches and basically to anybody who wants to do person-centered work, print those off, take them with you. Um, that will help give you a reminder. I'm not going to get deeply into Nora or her story or do an activity with you because I don't want to take up time that Tammy needs. But I do want to introduce you to a one-page description if that is not something that you're familiar to, uh, familiar with. In every one-page description, you'll notice three things. There's always what it takes to support the person, what others like and admire about them, and what's important to them. So we use this as a teaching tool for the coaches um, to be introduced to what a good one-page description might look like for someone who's in their home um, using services and supports and how they might include some similar details as they work with that person and develop that one page description. Over that course of six sessions, they would update the, the one page description each time. Um, in terms of the person centered planning results for Nora, as they would be for any other person, people feel listened to. When we recorded those details in such a way that they are um, indicative of what the person actually sees as balance in their life. Um, it helps reduce their anxiety. It really helps them have a way to introduce themselves to others that is warm and helps people want to lean in. Um, it helps people get the respect they deserve, and it helps others understand from their perspective what that balance looks like. Um, I'll just quickly touch on important two and important four. As I said, it's the foundational concept. If you take nothing else away from this today or from any person-centered training, if you can hold on to the foundational concept of important to is the stuff that sits on a person's heart, it keeps them happy, comforted, satisfied, fulfilled, uniquely who they are, versus important for, which is the stuff that keeps them healthy and safe. And that's the stuff that historically as a system we've done beautifully. We've never really messed up on that too much. Um, but important to important for and the balance between them, that will really help you have the best spirit and frame of mind for having conversations with people. Um, so do refresh yourself on the foundational concept before you engage in any of this work or if you think about what the coaches are doing, um, information that might be helpful to pass along about that balance between important to and important for from the person's perspective. Um, when we're looking at helping a person have a good balance in their life, um, it will include from the person's perspective services and supports that they desire so that they want for themselves that can help them live the life that they want from themselves for themselves, you know, in the most integrated setting possible. And if we're going to help people find a balance, we have to listen to what I call the hook. So if you think about that as a um, you know, none of us will do anything that's important for us. It's true of every human being. We won't do what's important for us if there's not some piece of important to connected to it. So I call that the hook between important to and important for. And a large part of what coaches will be doing or anybody who's doing person-centered work will be listening for the hook between what sits on the person's heart and what helps them be healthy and safe. Um, because if we figure out what that hook is for them, we're going to be able to help them consistently pay attention to their health and safety at the same time they're getting what's important to them. Um, 
I will just briefly touch on the importance of environments and then Tammy, I'm gonna turn it over to you in just a moment. I'm gonna breeze through the end of this quickly, but um, I think this is an important concept and the coaches have studied this a little more in depth because um, your own home can be a toxic environment if the things going on there are displeasing to you. So it's important for us to understand that the way people complain about their experience of the situation that they're in is through behavior. So when we see people who are aggressive or depressed or not engaged or things that we kind of think we need to do something about, we need to ask ourselves, is the environment they're in toxic or are they just tolerating a bunch of stuff that is not good for them? So, you know, we see people become um, helpless in those environments and they take that environment from a situation where maybe they're living in congregate care and they take it into a situation where we think, wow, this is great. They're gonna be in their own home directing their own services but they may still have a mindset that is somewhat institutional because they've learned to be helpless in that situation or they learned that they had no control. So now they've brought that behavior home with them where really things could change if we pay attention to those things that will help support them to have what they want in their life. So a focus on a good supportive environment and in cases where there is, has been some trauma of some sort, a healing environment would be important to emphasize. The difference is in a toxic or tolerated environment, people have power over the person and they're like, you should do this. But in a, a supportive or healing environment and the environment that the coach will be striving to create with the person, you're talking about a side-by-side -side or power with type of, of environment. So this is really about learning to support a person versus fix them. People aren't broken. We're learning from their perspective what feels like support and what will help them get closer to the lives they want for themselves. The coaches are going to be interested in um, addressing these seven questions with every person and making sure that the person can answer those questions for themselves. So the important to, important for balance. Um, you know, what they want to learn, what they need to learn, what needs to stay the same and what needs to change. And the person-centered skills will help them address those questions. I'll end with this, and I'm not going to go deeply into anything else now, but um, I'll just say that when we're talking about the coach's role in um, defining roles and responsibility, the coach's role in this particular um, project, they're going to look for opportunities to use the skills and um, help the person learn how to use the skills in advocating for themselves. They're going to model those desired behaviors and skills and consistently walk their person-centered talk, um, understand and use the person-centered resources and motivational interviewing uh, resources that are available to them, and really help the person to identify what is and isn't working in their life right now. The coach, though, can use some judgment and creativity in discussing things in a way that the person can actually hear them and understand what the coach is talking about. Um, and they will contribute to problem solving without taking the lead. And that's going to take, I think, for, for everybody practice when we engage in person-centered skills. It's very easy to jump into fix-it mode and want to fix everything we see, but the coach's role will really be to take a step back and make sure that they're letting the person lead and giving the person the opportunity and the information they need to lead the process as much as possible. It's not the coach's role to make sure that people use the skills or learn the skills. They're going to introduce them. They're going to show the person how they work. They're going to use them side by side, but if the person chooses not to use them, that's not really the coach's responsibility and there's not a lot they can do about that. They also can't have every effort work. They're gonna try things that don't work. That's part of being person-centered. Um, and they also are not responsible for solving all the problems the person identifies. Um, and they certainly aren't responsible for procuring supports or services for the person. So I will um, skip ahead just a little bit to tell you that the coaches are also using some motivational interviewing techniques in all of the person-centered conversations to convey things like acceptance, to convey partnership and how important it is to have that side-by-side -side stance, compassion, how to evoke from the person, um, conversation about change or evoke from the person, conversation about balance between important to and important for, all of that in an effort to really get the clearest picture possible to help the person advocate for themselves as they use their person-centered skills to direct their own plan. 
So the key take home points for you, I think, is um, really thinking about the coach's role and helping the person advocate for themselves and for the change in, changes that the person has identified that they want or need to make, um, that you are side by side with the person if you are a coach. So the relationship with the person is a partnership and you are helping them use the skills. You are talking with them about how they can use the skills, but you're really getting out of the way and letting them do it. Um, that motivational interviewing and person-centered practices are both techniques to both elicit and to guide the person a little bit. And when we do that, what we're doing is drawing from a well that is um, full of the person's strengths and their capacity. So we're bringing that forward and really taking a background role in that. Um, if you're using motivational interviewing and being person-centered, um, then the person is the one arguing for change, not the coach. Um, and that is a big shift for most of us. Um, and this is a heart set. It's a value-based set of skills. We really want coaches to lead this through example and modeling the skills and use person-centered practices in all of their interactions. Um, it's not motivational interviewing or person-centered practices if you don't use the spirit of it. And it's in no way meant to be manipulative or per persuasive. Where that can get tricky is when we learn about that hook, we want to use that as like a sledgehammer to say, okay, you know, you know, this is the hook or whatever, but to always bring the person back to their own goals and their perspective of what um, equals balance for them is a really nice way to think about how to, how to help the person move in the right direction without being manipulative or persuasive. So we want the person to be autonomous and we will support them. Um, and it's very normal for people in these situations, in any situation where they're making decisions about their life to have ambivalence. We all have that as we approach big changes or things that need to change in our life. Um, and so we'll listen with change talk, which is a motivational interviewing technique. Um, and remembering that coaches are not responsible for the person. They're responsible, the person is responsible for themselves. Um, and my final one, and I think this is one that is helpful, not only in this initiative, but just in life in general, almost everybody has the answers to their questions built into them. Our role often is just to listen and help elicit or emerge uh, the answers that the person has or uncover from their perspective, what does that balance look like? We've included some resources for you. I know you, that you will have a copy of this, or I hope that you'll have a copy of my presentation. You certainly can, and, and I don't mind if Tammy sends it to people. Um, the learning community is one of the places where you can get all of the skills. You can print them off. You can get the skill reflection sheets. There's an example of one-page descriptions at the one-page description website. Um, my website, Support Development Associates, is here. And then just some further information for assistive technology for you. Very helpful when we're helping people be autonomous is to think about the ways technologies can support them to do that. And a few more additional resources for your reading pleasure, including if you have questions about the HCBS rule and how it impacts your work, please look there. Um, and then I'll just stop here and see if there are any questions and answers and tell Tammy, I am sorry I've run over by a few minutes. I hope you can get it all No in. worries. So, well, no worries. Mine is not Tanya. very long. <laughs> so Tanya, we do have a question in the chat for you. Um, and the question is, what is the process for assisting someone who has marginal capacity and no power of attorney or healthcare proxy? So, so no informal supports that could you know, sort of inform that person-centered planning. So David, as best as possible, getting people who know the person is important. And I realize what I'm saying in some cases is a little bit difficult because there may be people who have been fairly well isolated going into a facility and coming out certainly be more isolated because they've not had any contact with people who they knew prior. Um, but wherever possible, making sure that we are including friends, neighbors, people who know the person well in helping us understand from the person's perspective um, and then what I would say is we're still not off the hook if we can't find those people. We continue to use our person-centered skills and do our very best to have those conversations. Um, there may be, it may take a little more time with someone, it may take a lot more time with someone who has um, a less of ability to tell you. And it may actually take a lot of time with people who have not ever experienced making decisions for themselves. They may have capacity to do it but they have not had that experience and it may feel very overwhelming. So I would say, take your time, do your best. 
um, look for those people who like and admire the person and try to include them when you can. Um, they, aren't ma they aren't magic skills, so you're not going to you know, make it perfect by doing that, but that's going to be the very best you can do in those situations. All right, Tammy. Well, thank you, Tanya. I think that was um, very helpful. Um, it really solidified some of the things that you know, the coaches and I have been talking about and working with um, those skills. So we appreciate your time. And now you guys, I'm gonna go through um, in a little bit more in detail what the coaches are going to be doing um, and things like that, uh, kind of you know, pr practical things uh, for us to, to know and to look at. And then Suzanne, I'm hoping you can just, um, just throw questions at me. At the end, I think we'll do the questions if that's okay. Um, please, I invite you guys to take notes um, and, uh, and put things in the chat, however you wanna ask the questions at the end. Um, so as you guys uh, mostly know that there's education outreach specialists that are doing nursing home presentations right now about um, uh, referrals to open doors, section Q, blah, 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 blah. You've all heard that before. So now the person-centered, um, the ENO specialists have two different roles. They are also person-centered coaches. So you kind of have two roles in, in one uh, person. Um, the, the, the MFP Open Doors Transition Center has expanded to include all of this. Um, so we offer transition, we offer peer, we offer um, the training, we offer the Open Doors phones, good neighbor program, and now this um, post-transition coach, uh, post coaching is all part of this MFP um, Open Doors program. So what is coaching? I think Tanya really got into um, the person-centered piece of it. Um, I looked up what is a coach. A coach um, can help guide people to change the way, uh, change in the way they wish to change and help guide them and go into a direction they want for their future planning. Um, coaches are not advocates. Um, if you think of an advocate, you think of a champion, a supporter, a promoter, protector, defender, et cetera. Um, coaches are specifically, are using uh, skills that are specifically designed by Tanya and her group uh, to guide people who just transitioned out of the nursing home to be their own champion, to be their own um, advocate. And hopefully that those um, skills build upon each other and help and, and um, help the person really focus. Um, and the other hope is that coaching will kind of deinstitutionalize the participants thinking in their own lives uh, that now that they're out of a nursing home and what the future planning is going to look like. There's going to be an ENO uh, education outreach coaching specialist in each region. Most of you already know who that is. And if you don't, just let me know and I can let you know who that is. Um, they, again, are still gonna be doing um, the, the, the nursing home presentations and they're gonna be doing um, this, this coaching with people. Um, the, e, the ENO specialists will be reaching out directly to the participants that have transitioned out um, but the TS can still speak to the participants about this um, program. There's no need for them to sign anything. This is under open doors, so it falls under the informed consent. People can accept or decline um, the coaching up to 60 days post-transition. Okay, so this does not affect TS, HS, peer, doesn't affect anything else, um, but they can um, wait and accept it uh, up to 60 days post-transition date. Um, and if someone accepts, they can stop at any time. It's a voluntary program. So if somebody has a coach for two weeks, then they have somebody for two weeks. Um, it, is, uh, it is a, there's gonna be about six to eight sessions in a period of two months. That's how long the coaches will be in and doing these things for two months um, or however long that that person um, needs. If they only want two weeks, okay. Um, again, it's, it's really voluntary. Um, uh, the coaches will be reaching out to the participants about one to two weeks after transition. Um, we realize that once somebody transitions, they're thinking about more of the fundamental needs. Uh, food, where's my shower chair? Uh, how's my rent getting paid? Those kinds of more fundamental things I think are happening. So we're gonna, we're gonna give them a little bit of a buffer uh, before we contact them. But again, TSs can certainly talk to them about the coaching that the person's gonna be hearing about. You're also going to start seeing coaching notes in the database. Um, so again, it's all MFP and open doors. So it's all going to be in the database. Um, the difference is 
um, between what a TS does and HS a peer. Uh, you all are advocates, assisting people in getting supports and the services, you're sharing your experiences. The coach is working directly and with the participant to focus on their goals that they have set for themselves. Okay, so they're not working necessarily with you, the coaches, uh, as a TS and HS a peer. They're really gonna be working with just the participant. Uh, ENO specialists have been asked to join all the staff meetings here and there um, at each of the centers to help answer questions, talk about the coaching um, with you guys, talk about um, whatever questions you might have. Uh, and it, it, especially as we move along in this process, you guys will have a, a direct link with an ENO um, person, which I think will be helpful. Um, uh, I, from Niall, I'm going to be running the reports and sending the leads and coaches the list of the MFP qualified participants for our coaches to contact. So you as TSs do not need to make referrals. Um, it's just going to be offered to all participants who have, uh, who are qualified MFP um, transition um, participants. Um, Suzanne did attach a, she attached a brochure to the invite, um, but it's getting extra fancied up. Um, Alex Thompson, our communications director over at Nile, it did a really nice job. And we're gonna have brochures printed out and sent to each center that explains the coaching, uh, very similar to what you, you know, got in your email. It's very, very similar. Um, and then you can hand those out to participants and things like that. So um, Stacy from Department of Health had a couple of things she wanted to say. If, if I don't already say them, Stacy, would you like to hop on? Before we move on to Stacy, uh, Natasha has her hands raised. Do you want to just an answer Natasha's question? Sure. Hi, Natasha. Hi, Tammy. Um, so understanding what the person-centered planning is, I completely understand that. And then understanding everyone else's role. I would like to know if this these coaches would also, after the fundamental time, assist with understanding that they have to go into the supermarket and purchase food and they have to pay their con Edison every day. Like nope. who does that? Because we get a ton of questions and concerns after they're gone right. on the uh, understanding that you have to go and purchase food and you have <laughs> to go and do like, these are independent things you have to go and do like, and maybe someone can answer, but who does that? I mean, nope. I know the role, I know, T you know, I know everyone's role, Mm -hmm. but so, so these are great questions, really Natasha. Bills, everyone. When somebody, so ideally, this is all ideally. Now I know reality is a whole nother thing outside of theory, <laughs> okay. but ideally when somebody's transitioning out of um, a facility, the hope is that the transition plan has, uh, you know, the, 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 those things are worked out prior <coughs> to the hope. Oops, let me just um, mute Michael. Um, so that is the hope that those things have already been answered or they're answered within that maybe first week or two. Um, but that's where transition specialist post um, transition specialist comes in. That's something that maybe the transition specialist can work with that person on who to pay that to, how to do this, where's that, what's this, when they're trying to na navigate their, their home world now. What the coach would do is going to say, uh, so the person's like, you know, I'm so confused. I don't know who's paying why I, I'm, I, if, if the person wants to look at what all this is and who's paying what, then the coach can utilize those very specific skills that Tanya had, um, had, uh, listed out for you. And they can try to help guide them to, and, and maybe organizing. Okay. So on the first of the month, uh, this is what's going to happen on the 15th of the month. This is what's going to happen. Um, and have them have a tangible thing after 60 days, maybe a, a contact list or a calendar or whatever, um, so that that person has, if that's what they want, has the skills or has the um, a, a tangible thing to say, okay, I think I know who to call when I have a question. Okay, so it's not going to be the TS is going to go, all right, coach, um, this is what, you know, this is what she needs work on. Mm -mm, no. No, no, no. It's really going to be person-centered focus. So the walls, I use this example, I just used it with Demita and Susan Stahl over in Rochester, and it was really funny. The walls literally could be burning around you and that person. And while the coach is sitting there, you know, talking about things, the coach is not going to call 911. 
The coach is going to talk to the person about the walls burning around them, but the coach is not going to be the one to call 911. They're going to role model. They're going to do the skills. They're going to figure out, is this important to you? Now, in reality, of course, we're going to call 911, but you know, I'm, I'm using that as a very uh, dramatic example because otherwise you guys get sick of hearing my voice. Um, but it's really, I really want to make it uh, very, the roles need to be very clear and separate so that there's no confusion. Okay, and what person's thing is, yeah. And uh, Natasha, just so you know, you'll have Carolyn and Troy sitting in on staff meetings. So, you, you know, you can ask these questions as you go. Same with oh, you all. That's perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Did, is Stacy on? I know she was. There she is. Stacy, you are unmuted, but if you're talking, we can't hear you. Oh, can, can you hear me? Oh, now? there you are. Yep, there we you can go. hear you. Okay. I was double muted. <laughs> <laughs> How's that possible? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, sometimes these uh, technical issues elude me. <laughs> 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 um, so I just wanted to, to reinforce um, some of the things that, that Tanya and Tammy um, have mentioned this morning, that the coaching role is, you know, we want it to be presented as, you know, part of the continuum of services that the transition, uh, uh, the transition assistance um, is compiled of. Um, that we would expect that the transition specialist would talk to the participant about coaching, um, a little bit about what it is at a very high level, um, you know, um, kind of presented as almost an opt out rather than opt in, not, not that formally, but you know, that the expectation that, you know, once you're discharged, no, a coach will be contacting you so set it up as an expectation. Don't you know, tell them that it's voluntary and stuff. But um, I, I think that if, if we avoid presenting it as a separate and distinct like service, I, I think people are going to be uh, more receptive. Um, you know, they're going to be overwhelmed when they first get out. Um, but if they if it's presented from the the TS standpoint as part of those support services that the program is providing, um, I, I just want to um, sit better with folks and I think they'll be more receptive. Yeah, that's a good um, point, Stacey. If the TS is saying this is a part of uh, your transition center, you know, this is a part of transitioning, people might know, really right, like it. Say, you know, my, my, my partner, the coach, you know, you kind of you let them know that you're all part of the same program. Um, and they, the other thing, um, Natasha, the, the point that you brought up, um, you know, made me think that there's got to be a lot of communication um, between the coach and the TS. Um, you know, if there's something that the TS identifies that a person is really struggling with, I think that might be important information to pass to the coach. And the coach could then um, maybe bring in that topic as they're doing their sessions um, to use it as an example and to, to work through. Um, but that's all that would be. It would be an example. Yeah. It would not be, yeah. I really want to stray away from the TS saying, this is what's going on. Coach, can you fix this? It's not, right. that's not right. person-centered. So I really want to make sure that the you all realize that. Stacey's absolutely right. If something's going on, use that as an example. That's a great point, but it's not going to be quote unquote fixed. Yeah. And, and as it, Tammy said, that the coach is not going to be like a, a TS extender. <laughs> 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 it is, you know, it is a, a very separate and distinct role and a very time limited role. And the coach's role is to, um, try to impart skill development um, to the participant um, and the, you know, the, the TS's role is, is more than the, the nitty gritty and, and um, 
you know, not a bad idea. You know, if someone's really struggling, you know, especially after the, the coach's role is done, um, that the, the TS, you know, can refer back to maybe some of those tools or the, the, the skills to remind the person, you know, you went over this with it in the, your coaching mm -hmm. session, um, you know, maybe give them some suggestions on, on what things they might want to try. Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the coaching session, the hope is that that person will have a contact list and a face, you know, that, that face sheet that we saw about Nora that Tanya had presented. So there's kind of a couple of tangible things that we're really hoping that the coaches can leave with that participant that they can utilize with, um, you know, you, uh, their, their, their care managers or staff, whatever. Um, somebody has more questions. Yeah, uh, when point out that there's a question about, yeah, when, it, when yeah. is this rolling out? It is rolling out this week. I am going to be sending the coaches, and I think they know this already. <laughs> um, after this training, um, I'm going to be sending them a list of uh, people who have transitioned already. So they're not contacting people and they're not involved with people until they are home. Okay, so this is post transition. There's, they're not going to be part of the discharge plan. You know, we thought about it and it's just, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen sometimes. And that could really, that extra person could really add a, a level of confusion. Again, we really want to have that buffer zone. Uh, this is, this is the, an extension of your transitioning. Um, and this is your home view of things, not anything to do with the nursing home. And I will just put in a plug that the way Tammy is running these reports is contingent on the TS putting in the MFP transition date. So I'll put in a plug for the TSs to get your transition dates in there ASAP because that'll uh, trigger getting a coach. Oh, mm. yeah, sooner than later. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we're going to find out after the fact and that's okay. Um, you know, we'll, we'll do what we can do. Terry, you raised your hand. Yep. Um, so during the presentation, she said that a participant should transition with a one page plan. So is the transition specialist going to be doing that plan so, or is this going to be no, further down no, the road? No, we're not adding anything to your, no, I'm not adding anything <laughs> to your, uh, your, your box there. No, no, no. Um, what Tanya was saying is that sometimes people are discharged with a one page. Tanya, correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, but one, sometimes when people are discharged from specific facilities, they are discharged with a one page, um, a one pager. I don't, I've never seen it. And I did transitions for many, many, many years. This is something that the coach is now going to be working on with that person because it maybe should be done before people transition out, but you know, we'll do it post. Yeah, yeah, ideally you you would see it, but not every state does it. Not every, that's not if that's not your model, then you might not see it. But it will be helpful for people to have, and so coaches building one with them over the six sessions would be great. Okay, thank you. Good question, Tyree. I know there's more questions. Oh, I know it. <laughs> oh, there's something in the chat. Hang on, let me see. Uh, Marcy, are you contacting anyone who already transitioned recently or just, tra oh, no, we're going to actually, I'm going to run the report for probably the past month or so. I'm going to see what that kind of looks like. Um, so, nope, as of today, I'm going to see who transitioned in the past four to six weeks and see and give, uh, start giving out, you know, the names of people. Again, that will depend on how many have transitioned in, in the regions and I have to balance that out a little bit for the uh, coaches, but. I'm going to try to do maybe a month that have already transitioned out as of today. Let me see. Juanita has a question. Are there, are the lists going to be assigned? How are they assigned? I'm going to have the regional leads assign. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know how I think about it. I say it out loud. I'm thinking, what did I just say? Tammy, Tammy, my yeah. question is, is, we have no way of doing that assignment yet currently, right? In the database? No, you do. I oh, it's not seen there any, yet. There's, uh, not, there's not an you know, role, but there will be. There will be. All right, so uh, I'm going to okay. assign it as T. I'm just going to assign them as TS. Okay, I got gotcha. you. All right, I got gotcha. you. Because yeah. I just was wondering how that was right. working. I was thinking it was, but. Yeah, the, the database, we have a whole list of things that are going to change in the database, and that's one of them. There's going to be an, you know, role. 
um, just like there's a peer role, a TS role, an HS role. Right. It, it's, right. Not, it's not there today, but it will be. So anybody that I have, that I have, like, I know, like yesterday I had somebody discharge. Can I go ahead and assign that to, to Ted or is that, I, I'd like to wait for your thing to go forward. Hmm. I say assign him. Okay. So we would he, just assign just, him. Yeah, the, just yeah. assign him. Um, Cause I'm going to be doing the list and he'll see it on the list and he'll go, Oh, I already, I already talked to that person. So he'll be good. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Right. I like that. Um, uh, so Chris asked, is coaching in person or for over the phone? Great question. The expectation is that the coach will be going into participants' homes um, or wherever is convenient for them. Um, if for some reason the person is, you know, not feeling well or there's something going on they want to do over the phone or FaceTime, make sure you guys are ordering your open doors phones and the people maybe can do some FaceTime. Um, uh, they can meet at a park, you know, whatever. So it's, it's really going to be up to that person. Um, and Caitlin, this is voluntary for the participants. Yes. If they don't, of course, I raise my hand. Yeah, How do you raise you your hand while you're talking? Yeah. I can talk to you. Um, so Noelle's got her hand raised. Has had her oh. hand raised All right. And then Susan. Okay. So yes. Yeah, so Caitlin, this is voluntary. Like I said, um, nobody has to sign anything extra. Uh, it's, it falls all under the informed consent, um, and they can deny and they can stop services. They can, have, they can say, yes, I want to do this. And after two weeks, they can stop. Noel. Oh, you're muted, Noel. Is this the um, Thank you. is the coaching going to be like only after the initial transition, or if they refuse the coaching after the initial transition and say they get reinstitutionalized, can they now accept coaching after they've been reinstitutionalized? Yes. yes, I would. Oh, I mean, well, <laughs> so I'm thinking of two different things. So if a person is it go it's based on their transition date so some people transition twice you know that that they tra they transitioned and maybe a year later they end up back in a facility and then you're going to reopen them for another transition then yes no, if, no, if like my question i'm gonna can i give you an example yeah um we have a gentleman he was discharged at one point in like november um and then he's been in and out of the nursing home several times. If he say denied the coaching back in November, denied it the second time, he, would he be eligible for it the second or third time he came out of the nursing home? No, because it's 60 days after the transition happened. But, um, that's a great question though. Maybe we can talk about, you know, people that are have a high uh, reinstitutionalization rate or, uh, you know, uh, people with extra issues. Um, like that. Um, but at this point, I, I would say we haven't really thought of yeah. that. And if you've got somebody that you feel like, you know, they're in this cycle of, like you said, got sort of reinstitutionalization, let us know and we can talk about it and see if that's yeah. somebody we can help because we might be able to make an exception for someone. In that's the, what I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm thinking that's something I definitely want to talk about. So it's a really good point, Noel. Yeah. Because okay. we, don't, we, don't, we don't honestly have the answer at this moment. It's going to be ever changing. Uh, Susan. Um, just a small thing about the database. Um, Cause I know when you assign um, staff, um, I believe there's only two spots for the TS position. Uh -huh. um, there's a primary and a secondary. Uh -huh. um, so what if um, a couple of our cases are Cross regional and right, right. the secondary is already assigned. Um, if so if we need to get creative and make them appear or something, we'll get creative. Yeah, I'm okay. not worried. We'll figure we'll figure out because peers have three spots. You know, and, and it's uh -huh. like I said, we're the the change is coming to make an E and O spot, so it's just a, a temporary patch. Um, okay. If we have to do something creative for the temporary time, we can do that. Okay. <laughs> All right, there's another question from Marcy. Uh, for people who transition within the past four to six weeks, are you going to notify the TSs and or the leads so that they can give them heads up so that they don't deny the phone call if they cold call? Um, I was, I'm kind of going back and forth on this. Um, I think 
I, I think I'm going to send it to the leads. Um, um, and I, I, I don't know, Suzanne, what do you think? What do you think about that question? I'm kind of, I go, I'm going back and forth in my head about some stuff. Um, I think it's, as long as you're running the report, it's easy enough to put the TS on the right. report and easy enough to right. shoot an email at the same time. Okay. All right. So yeah, I'll give the, I'll definitely yeah, give it, have yeah, the TS give a heads much. up because you guys haven't been able to give a heads up yet. Um, moving forward, you can obviously. Um, so yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll do that. I'll, I'll, um, I'll include the TSs in on the lists for now. Again, the TSs don't have to do anything. They can just, just know that. And then they can let the um, participant know a coach will be contacting them. Yeah. Cause if we, if you go back the six weeks and you don't tell us and we don't tell them like, this is a part of our program, they might get a mm -hmm. call be like, who the heck are you? Yeah, no. And hang up or not answer mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So people will give us the opportunity to at least tell them like somebody's sure. going to be calling you. Sure, sure. No, I like that idea. Okay. Um, Decky has a question. Coaching is offered to all participants who are post discharge, including OPWDD, I believe. Yes. If they're qualified uh, MFP, then we will offer them coaching. Good questions. All right. Well, if that is that, um, you know, we have our statewide TS meetings. You guys can um, reserve your questions for that as well or email me. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you guys really enjoyed the person centered from um, the, the processing and the or the, or the slides, I don't know what I'm saying, uh, from Tanya. I, I love hearing it each and every time I take a little something different from it. So. Uh, thank you all and